This podcast assumes that you have a general knowledge of the Tate LaBianca murders. Sharon Tate Polanski, Jay Sebring, Wojciech Frykowski, Abigail Folger, and Stephen Parent were murdered on Cielo Drive in Los Angeles on August 9, 1969. Lino and Rosemary LaBianca were slain in their Los Feliz residence the following night. Charles Manson, Charles Watson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Quinwinkle, and Leslie Van Houten were convicted of those murders. Say hello to the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast. Hi, I'm George Stimson. Welcome to the eighth episode of the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast. This episode is a little late because we've been working on the second printing of Lynette Fromey's book, Reflection, which will be available soon. In previous episodes of this podcast, I have examined five homicidal incidents which occurred in Los Angeles, California in the summer of 1969. To recap, those incidents were The Hollywood shooting of Bernard Crow on July 1, 1969. Although Bernard Crow was not killed, his death at the hand of Charles Manson was assumed, and therefore his shooting figured into the dynamics and events which followed as if he had been killed. The murder of Gary Hinman in Topanga Canyon on July 27, 1969. The homicides which occurred at 10,050 Cielo Drive on August 9, 1969. The homicides which occurred at 3301 Waverly Drive on August 10, 1969. The murder of Donald Shorty Shea near Spawn's Movie Ranch on about August 28, 1969. Just after the murder of Donald Shea, if not on the same day than on the day after, Charles Manson and many of his friends and associates left Spawn's Ranch and moved to the desert area west of Death Valley with their activities centered on the beautiful Barker Ranch in Golar Wash in the Panamint Mountains. It was at the Barker Ranch that Manson and most of his associates, including Susan Atkins, were arrested on October 10th and 12th, 1969, on charges ranging from grand theft auto to arson. Members of the group were held in the Inyo County Jail in Independence. While being held in Independence, some of the desert arrestees became linked to the Tate-LaBianca murders because of the investigation into Susan Atkins' connection to the murder of Gary Hinman. Someone in law enforcement noticed the similarities in the three sets of homicides, death by stabbing, writing on the walls in the victim's blood, and the use of variations of pig in those writings, and came to the conclusion that the persons involved in the Hinman murder might still be at large and still killing. That conclusion was not enough to convince authorities that Bobby Beausoleil was not involved in the Hinman homicide, however, since the evidence against him in that case was solid. He remained jailed. The investigation into the similarities between the Hinman and Tate LaBianca murders was based in large part on witness statements, which led to suspects being named, which led to some of those suspects being linked to the crimes by physical evidence, fingerprints, which led to the announcement on December 2nd, 1969, that the murders had been solved. And how. Not only were they solved, but they were solved with an explanation so bizarre that the sensationalism of the murders was immediately overwhelmed by the sensationalism surrounding the suspects. These suspects were not merely a group of social dropouts who were living at Spahn's ranch. Rather, they were something never encountered before in the United States a killer cult, a group of homicidal hippies led by a murderous madman, Charles Manson. As presented to the public, the killers were Charles Watson, also known as Tex, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, Linda Kasabian, and Charles Manson. From the outset, the die was cast and the story was set. Charles Manson was presented as the evil leader of a hippie cult. This headline gives away the game. 
the case was already being transformed into an entertainment extravaganza. As the leader of this alleged cult, Charles Manson was naturally responsible for everything that his friends and associates did, and that especially included the Tate LaBianca murders. Manson, as the leader, must have ordered his followers to commit them. He must have been responsible. He must have been guilty. The negative publicity generated towards Charles Manson and his friends was unrelenting, and it didn't take more than a few minutes for the image of Manson as the leader of a group of homicidal hippies to become the established reality to a public ready to grasp at any explanation for such brutal and seemingly bizarre murders. But now that the who part of the question had been answered, the big question left was the why. What was the reason given for Manson and his associates to be involved in these murders? Why did the people from Spawn's Ranch end up in the houses on Cielo and Waverly Drives? Early explanations in the media were vague. There was some mention of Manson's supposed desire to start a race war by committing the murders, but it wasn't clear what he hoped to benefit from it. What advantage would he gain by starting a racial conflagration? But for now, motive didn't matter. Manson's trial by the media was already over. At his arraignment for murder on December 17th, he told it like it was. The news media has already executed and buried me. The people are hypnotized by the lies being told to them. Conviction in the media is easy. A few glaring headlines and some well-chosen photographs is all it takes. But this presented a problem because conviction in a courtroom is a little more difficult. In a courtroom, there are standards of evidence and demonstrations of proof of allegations necessary before a person can be convicted. In this case, that was not a problem for five of the defendants charged in the murders. They were linked to the crime either by physical evidence or statements admitting that they were present when the crimes occurred. But with Charles Manson, there was no such evidence. And that was a problem because since he had already been convicted in the court of public opinion, it was essential that he also be convicted in the California Superior Court system. So there had to be a reason for Manson to have ordered those murders. And an alleged desire to foment a race war was by itself not enough, because why would Manson want to foment such a war unless he expected to derive some benefit from it? Assigned to the case by the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, Deputy DA Vincent Bugliosi was desperate to find an answer to that question. Because if he couldn't produce a credible motive for Manson to have ordered the Tate LaBianca murders, he would have no evidence of Manson's intent, the malice of forethought necessary for a murder conviction. Desperate for some indication of Manson's intent, Bugliosi was willing to cast a wide net with no possibility considered too outlandish. And since he would eventually indeed come up with an outlandish motive, he set the reader of Helter Skelter up for the theory of the crime that he settled on when he wrote, from the moment I was assigned to the case, I'd felt that for murders as bizarre as these, the motive itself would have to be almost equally strange, not something you'd find within the pages of a textbook on police science. Bugliosi got a boost in this direction from a statement made by Roman Polanski during his police interview after the murders. If I'm looking for a motive, I'd look for something which doesn't fit your habitual standard with which you use to work as police. Something much more far out. Finally, after diligent questioning of many witnesses, Bugliosi did latch onto a theory of the crime that gave him what he needed to convict Charles Manson. That theory was helter-skelter, a motive that was both bizarre and demonstrated intent on the part of Manson. Helter-skelter was a concept based on a race war occurring in the United States. Part of the impetus for this theory were the reports of Manson wanting a race war that were published in the news media immediately after his arrest. Another part came from some of the residents of Spahn's Ranch, where the concept of a society-destroying revolution called Helter Skelter was certainly bandied about. Yet another impetus for the idea of a race war was the fact that one was almost already occurring in the streets of many American cities. 
The biggest bolster to Bulliosi's helter-skelter theory came from former Manson associate Paul Watkins, who supplied the district attorney with many details about the fantastic concept. And Watson also provided what Bulliosi needed most, a personal motive for Charles Manson wanting to start a race war. It is worth mentioning here that Paul Watkins had been estranged from the people at Spahn's Ranch since January of 1969, eight months before the murders took place, and thus he would have had no knowledge of the events and dynamics existing in Los Angeles in the summer. The helter-skelter motive is so complex that it takes almost 50 pages of the hardback edition of Helter Skelter to explain it to readers. But to put it succinctly, here's Vincent Bugliosi explaining Manson's supposed motive during the murder trial. To ignite Helter Skelter, to start the black-white uh, revolution, Manson envisioned that white people would turn against the black man if they thought the black man had committed these seven murders and ultimately there would be a civil war between blacks and whites out in the street. Mm -hmm. Manson told his followers that this would be a bloodbath in the streets of every American city. Manson foresaw that the black man would win this war. But later on he said the black man, because of inexperience, would simply not be able to handle the reins of power. So we would have to look around at those white people who had survived, who had escaped from Helter Skelter. In other words, turn over the reins of power to Charles Manson and his family. So in the last analysis, Mr. Manson, in his mind, uh, in his twisted mind, he envisioned that he and his family would be the ultimate beneficiaries of a black-white civil uh -oh. war. And here is Los Angeles Deputy District Attorney Stephen Kay detailing the particulars of the helter-skelter motive during Charles Manson's 1992 parole hearing. The enormity and cruelty of these murders almost defies belief. The motive for the Tate and LaBianca murders is enough in and of itself for the board to deny Mr. Manson uh, parole and Mr. Watson and the, uh, the three girls parole forever. Helter Skelter, what was this and, and how did it start? Well, it started by Manson, <clears throat> who was the guru on LSD trips, uh, leading his family members uh, through the trips. They would listen to the Beatles' White Album and Mr. Manson and the others, and it wasn't just Mr. Manson alone because they would kind of feed on each other. And they determined listening to the White Album with songs like Helder Skelter, Revolution 9, Blackbird, uh, Piggies, uh, Sexy Sadie, Back in the USSR, that the Beatles were the prophets talked about in Revelations 9 and 10 of the Bible. Mr. Manson, I heard even uh, is still uh, quoting the Bible. He could quote the Bible uh, very well, but twist it to mean what he wanted it uh, to mean. Mr. Manson felt that there was going to be this black-white revolution, and the family uh, was going to be the beneficiaries, because the blacks uh, were going to kill all of the whites, except for Manson and the family. And Manson and the family were going to escape to the bottomless pit, talked about in Revelations 9 and, uh, Revelations 9 and 10 of the Bible and they would live in this bottomless pit for uh, 50 to 100 years in miniaturized form. And then they would have grown to the size of 144,000, the 12 tribes of Israel. And at the end of this 50 to 100 year period, Manson and the family would come out of the bottomless pit and there would only be blacks uh, left, black president, black senators, black congressmen. Uh, but Manson, <clears throat> who is a real racist, thought the blacks were too stupid to maintain power. And as soon as he and the family came out of the bottomless pit, the blacks would rush up to him and turn over all power. Now, it was never clear whether he was going to rule the world, but at least he was going to rule the United States. Now, I know this sounds uh, bizarre, uh, but the problem is that Manson and his followers believed in this motive enough to kill uh, innocent people. And there you have it. All of that is in the court records of this case and is thus considered to be the legal truth, the official reality of this case. Is all of that credible to you? So now we know what the prosecution says was the reason for the murders, but what do the people who were present at Seattle and Waverly Drives during those murders say was the motive for their crimes? Charles Watson, the main killer at the Polanski and LaBianca houses, said in his book, Will You Die For Me?, that there were three main reasons for the killings, to ignite helter-skelter, to get money for the move to the desert, 
and to get Bobby Beausoleil out of jail by committing murders similar to the one that he was charged with, the so-called copycat motive. Watson's book was published in 1978, and Watson has said that he read Helter Skelter several times right after it was published in 1974, so that might explain his inclusion in his book of Helter Skelter as a motive for the murders. Because before that, at his trial for murder, Watson testified that he went to the Cielo Drive house simply because Charles Manson told him to go there and kill everyone on the premises. He didn't offer any reason for Manson to have told him this. In fact, if you read Watson's trial testimony, you'll see that he seems really out of it, that he couldn't concentrate, that with regard to the purpose for the murders, he didn't know about the whole thing, really. We'll be coming back to this example of Charles Watson's apparent state of mind at the time of the murders later in this podcast series. Watson also said later, on being questioned at his parole hearing in 1990 about whether the murders were intended to spark a revolution, that no, the revolution would not be based on my crime. In Child of Satan, Child of God, Susan Atkins also discounts Helter Skelter as a motive. It is entirely possible that some in our group, perhaps including Charlie himself, had in our satanic state slipped into such ideas. But to the best of my knowledge, Helter Skelter was not the motive for the Tate LaBianca murders. Here is Patricia Krenwinkel at her 1993 parole hearing telling a board commissioner why she thought she was going to the Polanski residence. Prior, prior to going there to the residence, is that correct? He asked you to go with, you, with your crime partners? Yes, he came in and me out and then he told me to go and do whatever text said. Did he, uh, did he give you any other, any other instructions? No, just follow whatever text says. So then once you got in the vehicle and you were driving to this location, text was telling you what you were going to do? No, he never said anything until we were already there. Okay, so when you pulled up, is that the first time you knew what you were going to do? No, not until we were already across the um, fence. Okay, what did you think you were climbing over that wall for, or that fence? Probably to rob. Because that had been, recently there had been this push to try to get money um, so that we could go out into the desert. So it had been... Uh, Buggies had been stolen, and um, there had been people who liked stealing money. I see. Um, I, I did have a couple questions. In regards to the first residence that you went to, uh, the Polanski uh, residence, um, prior to leaving the ranch, you armed yourself with a knife, didn't you? Yes, I was given that. Okay. And when you went there, uh, and Mr. Watson was uh, cutting the uh, telephone wires. You, you were pretty well aware of what you were going to go into the residence for, weren't you? At the moment, I wasn't sure what we were going to do until he said what we were going to do. I had no idea. Because at that point in time, like I said, we had been going and doing um, robberies, basically. We had been stealing things. I had no idea that that's what the intention was at all. Okay, when you been expressed. Okay. When you say you had been doing robberies, uh, what do you mean by robberies? Uh, were you stealing from people or you were stealing out of houses or, or? Well, actually, there had been a couple robberies that were done in houses, yes. Where the victims were present? No. So you went into homes where no one was present, you took some property? Right. Okay. Did you think you're going to kill anyone? Absolutely not. Were you, uh, the type of person that wanted to kill someone at that point in time. Absolutely not. Why didn't you leave? I would have never thought of leaving. I didn't know what to do. I was waiting for instructions. Okay, so the first victim shot uh, outside of the actual residence itself, but on the property of the residence, right? And you've seen this person mortally wounded, now you go into the residence. And apparently you displayed your knife at that point in time and uh, actually rounded up three of the victims. I would, yes. And, and that would, would have been Miss uh, Tate, uh, Folger, and uh, one other person. Did, 
Did you take three people out of the bedrooms? When did I? Yeah, I think. Kind of round them up? Yes. Um, Sebring? Yes. Yes. Okay. You rounded them up and brought them all into one room? Sometimes I am not sure who said what and what really happened because there are so many accounts from everyone. So to do it, so to do complete justice, I don't have absolute recall of 25 years ago. I, I guess my, my, the issue here is when I, when I first listened to what you had to say, I got the impression that you were very naive, didn't know what was going to happen there, went in, were caught up in this thing, uh, one woman runs outside, you chase her and stab her, and then you kind of go off into the distance at the back house, and then all these other terrible things happen to everyone in the house. But actually, your, your role was a little bit different than that. You actually did help round up the people inside of the house. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when you rounded them up, I believe the, that's about the time that Miss Folger began fighting with you. She actually fought with you in the house, didn't she? Yes, when they were trying to tie people up, yes. Okay. And uh, how about Sebring? He, he started to... Uh, uh, yeah, he fought with the tanks. And then he ended up being shot at that time. Yes. And Folger ran outside, and that's when you pursued her yes. a after the initial fight and ended up stabbing her. Um, and so you had already seen, at this point in time, two persons murdered, or at least mortally wounded, and you yourself had participated in an additional one where someone was laying possibly mortally wounded. She had been stabbed numerous times. And then you went to the back house. Now, what did you think at that point? Three people were dying or dead. Yes, and that's, I felt, it's hard to describe because I just, I had no idea even how to connect a thought together at that point. I had no idea what we were gonna do when we went to that residence, when all the madness took place, I had absolutely no, there was no way to put together the kind of rational thinking because there was no rational thought in my head. I had followed the instructions as I had been told to do, as I've been doing for a very long time. And I, at that point, everything was out of my control. I felt helpless. I felt hopeless to do anything. All I was doing is carrying through a macabre dance. It was horrible, and I didn't know how to stop it. <clears throat> and I never knew how to stop it, just like I never knew how to stop Manson all along. In discussing the LaBianca murders a few minutes later, a parole board member asked, were these murders intended to instigate the revolution? That was not my intent, Cranwinkle answered, because I had no idea why we were doing it. Later on, that has become something that Manson has used and said, yes. In 1992, Bobby Beausoleil was asked by his parole board, had you heard Manson or any of the family members talk about Helter Skelter and a war between the blacks and whites? Had you heard that before? Beausoleil replied, no, I had not heard that until in the media. I never heard that. I did hear... There was a song called Helter Skelter by the Beatles, and I had heard the song, of course. At his 1993 parole hearing, Bruce Davis offered his opinion of the Helter Skelter motive. I don't believe the part about the race war. I mean, it was fantasy. I don't think anybody really believed that as that what's going to happen. Later in that same hearing, the representative of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office Deputy District Attorney Jeffrey Jonas told the board, and I'm convinced that Helter Skelter was used as a means to convict Manson. I've read a lot of things that Beausoleil said, and I'm not really satisfied in my mind that Helter Skelter was the overriding thing as to why they went out and did what they did with all these other people. I don't think that it was a specific motive, Helter Skelter, that caused that. Not even the prosecution's star witness, Linda Kasabian, says that the reason she and the other people went to the Polanski residence was to commit murders in order to instigate a race war. At the trial, she testified that she thought the group was simply going out on a creepy crawly mission. Not surprisingly, 
Charles Manson also disputes that Helter Skelter was the motive for the crimes, or that it referred to a race war at all. As he testified at the murder trial, Helter Skelter means confusion, literally. It doesn't mean any war with anyone. It doesn't mean that some people are going to kill other people. Helter Skelter is confusion. Confusion is coming down around you fast. If you can't see the confusion coming down around you fast, you can call it what you wish. And yet another person who has always had doubts about the Helter Skelter motive is Vincent Bugliosi himself. As we have seen, in Helter Skelter, Bugliosi recalled his reservations about the Helter Skelter motive at the time that he was preparing for the trial. I felt we had a personal motive for Manson. It was just that it was almost unbelievably bizarre. Helter Skelter was far out, admittedly bizarre, Bugliosi conceded, and he told a co-prosecutor it wouldn't take me two seconds to dump the whole Helter Skelter theory if he could find another motive in the evidence. There was another motive in the evidence. The problem was that motive was not a motive for Charles Manson. The idea that Charles Manson might actually be not guilty of the murders was apparently not considered, not even for a second. So, Bugliosi was stuck with Helter Skelter as the only motive that showed intent on the part of Charles Manson. And without intent, a murder conviction for Manson could not stand. But did even Vincent Bugliosi really believe that it was the motive? In a 1976 interview in Penthouse magazine, he made a stunning admission. This is the June 1976 issue of Penthouse magazine. In June 1976, I was graduating from college. Wow. This is Vincent Bugliosi at his apogee. Helter Skelter was still a runaway bestseller, and the TV movie based on the book that aired earlier that year was the highest rated TV movie of all time. He had many more book projects in the works covering a variety of controversial events in recent American history. Yes, this is Bugliosi at his zenith and in his element. In this interview, while discussing Helter Skelter, Bugliosi is asked why he believed Manson could convince his alleged followers to commit mass murder for him. In his answer, he says that Manson's friends bought into the Helter Skelter scenario hook, line, and sinker. But then, with regard to Charles Manson, he makes a rather remarkable admission. Whether he believed it, I'd have to guess no. Whether he believed it, I'd have to guess no. Therefore, not only did most of the convicted killers refute the helter-skelter motive, but even the senior deputy district attorney who actually prosecuted the case and other lawyers in the DA's office didn't believe that Helter Skelter was the motive for the Tate LaBianca murders. Why is that important? I will explain why in a future installment of this podcast. But in the meantime, if Helter Skelter was not the motive for the Tate LaBianca murders, what was? What would motivate people from Spahn's ranch to go out and kill seven persons? I will offer my answer to those questions in the next episode of the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast. This has been the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast, the podcast dedicated to the truth about the Tate LaBianca murders, Charles Manson, and more. The views expressed on this program are solely those of the individual speakers, and they do not necessarily represent the thoughts, ideas, or opinions of any other persons, either living or dead. Visit our companion website at www.goodbyehelterskelter.com. There you can find more information about this podcast. Also, check out the Goodbye Helter Skelter Facebook page for information on upcoming programs. And let us know what you think by way of contact at goodbyehelterskelter.com. We will address any comments, questions, or concerns on future installments of the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast.